Hello everyone, today we talk about 11th century kite shield patterns, looking mostly at this symbolism behind the various devices uh, displayed uh, across quite a, a base areas, because we will stretch from the Bayeux tapestry to the Silitzes manuscript, um, and so looking at more or less the entire uh, Europe uh, as these symbols naturally were universal in nature and they, they went actually beyond uh, the same continent as we will see now. Um, and as a part of my series, in fact, about... We, we can speak of heraldry and I, was, mm, I will tell in a while why, because at least for those who know what heraldry is, you know, that we can't really talk about it for the 11th century, but there is also kind of a subtler point in this all. But also banners, flags, coats of arms in general, even uniforms, uh, given we talk also about modern warfare sometimes. So I have a playlist for all this stuff, a general one and some, you know, sub-divided uh, ones for each a single topic. And you know that I've been making videos about some kind of, you know, traditional symbolism, uh, animal symbolism, interestingly enough, uh, connect with all these ancestral meanings. Right? It's a bit of history of religion, a bit of history of anthropology, but it's deeply intertwined with, um, I'd say, with, with everything concerning reality, of course, but as far as our military history is concerned, as we will see now, um, much more deeply than what we're usually taught. Right? Normally, uh, um, a content like this, like kite shield patterns would fit mostly like, you know, wargamistic interest. How do I have to paint my the shield of my uh, my model soldiers in a diorama like to make them historically accurate? And of course there is a lot of beautiful art part of it. I uploaded uh, myself here uh, in the pictures. And the, the topic would be endless. That's why we just stick mostly to the iconographic evidence of the aforementioned sources, mostly about for the Normans and the Byzantines, but again, bearing in mind that this stuff was pretty much um, universal, or at least it was an incredibly shared amount of uh, of meanings, even ac all across Eurasia and so on, because these devices had a very specific practical function, which is what we have fundamentally eliminated from from the interest, right? Most of our way of making military history revolves around the material side of the story, the mechanic side of the story. Even when someone is more interested in symbolism and so on, there is, I think, um, an excessive skepticism regarding, ah, we, we, we see this symbol, but we can't really tell or know what it is. Like, if for anyone who has studied, like, the existent historiography about this, this kind of topics, I give you that it's not like a, a and this is the point, a very popular, fashionable um, branch, right, of knowledge um, for reasons that I think there is no need to discuss. They're mostly ideological and mostly political at the end of the day. But we have ingenerated this, th this concept for which, look at a shield, right, it's, uh, let's concentrate on the most important thing, how was it uh, built, right? It's obvious that here there is an important material function that uh, in, in a way was more important than wishful thinking regarding, for example, some uh, apotropaic functions per se. Um, but it, it's, it's way beyond that, right? That's an attitude I've seen also for, I don't know, Celtic uh, tattoos during, you know, in, in ancient times, why these warriors went out there naked with all these um, in deeply intricate, by the way, the symbols, etc. So it's just, you know, averting uh, enemy hits by asking the gods, but this is, th that's not correct, right? Th there is um, a part of that, which of course is present, like actually the, the worst part of the being, so having a sort of superstitious belief that just, you know, bearing this the symbols will essentially prevent you from 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 an effort which is said tremendous um, in order to be effective at the same time. And then there is another side of the story which was the one that was in fact more believed still in this times because also the Middle Ages were somehow already more secular and modern 
uh, with all the uh, decrees in individual moral strength. Uh, the, it doesn't matter whether for today's standards those were kind of uh, heroic figures comparatively. Um, and I'm really talking about the degree of moral load, not heroes in the moralistic sense that we intend today and that again is somehow completely escaping this dichotomic um, uh, say dyna uh, logic um, had of course lost part of the same meanings here we see of course the, the the same symbolism in part does fit some kind of further characterization in general uh, the, the point is that all meaning it gets down to some absolute right so any um, d parting from the absolute concept uh, which is also in fact impossible to represent it so also our art uh, manifests that this kind of limit in, in mankind uh, is somehow gone astray or at least is just depicting the path the way that this specific human has chosen to uh, come closer to the divine and going towards the divine not waiting for the divine just to descend for, for no reason or at least it's always the same thing at the same time except it's about the merit of the individual I also made recently a, a question and answer video where I was asked like how how did grace work right in say in, in pagan religions but as you know what we see, Christianly speaking, is exactly the same thing, independently from what people have come again to to modify it uh, over time, just because of ignorance, fundamentally, not just not because of of Christianity. And and obviously there was such need of uh, fitting, like being in perfect har harmony with the divine logos, and so essentially reaching a consonance that would allow you to transfigure. And this consonance was to be found essentially in holy war, which was present universally in every culture, right? Uh, still today, that it has nothing to do with theism, at least theism as such never, never existed. It's just, again, a modernistic invention. Um, and, um, and that was, in fact, to be met by the, the, the hero that managed, as we will see, to tame the dark forces within himself and most of this dark kind of fact tonic symbolism and or however its presence in uh, its blending right within a much more luminous Apollonian divine one is in fact represented in these patterns in this in this devices um, naturally not we, we can't understand fully air all of this because much of what we see here is, is the symbol per se and we know of course what it meant because there are some archetypal meanings attached to them but it's obvious that the thing was much more complex um, at the time for those who used and customized uh, these shields and um, as a consequence we can in part just guess and making it more complicated but otherwise the, the symbol per se is very well known universally and we can we can interpret it so why the kite the form of the shield is functional physically of course this matches with the fact that we're talking about a human body that according to doctrine is transfigurational in some way so the fact that we're just looking at a, allegedly a material thing should always take in consideration that humans are not just material things for that matter so we know what we're talking about this is a, um, a type of um, of shield that starts developing essentially from the 10th century in the 11th uh, finds its you know full um, uh, shape that would remain in fact for, for the following centuries as well it had a bronze or iron boss that was functional to protect uh, to deflect blows in a part but also to inflict some uh, the shield was hung round the neck and against the left shoulder by a strap. Uh, there were different methods of holding it that we'll see in, in a video dedicated more specifically about the, the shield structure um, per se. Um, and uh, th there were seemingly, in fact, different uh, 
grip styles as well um, say between the I don't know the Franks the Byzantines etc um, in any case while we find in sources like the Bayeux tapestry the shields looking rather flat um, 11th century sources certainly speak explicitly of, of kite shields as convex or slightly curved um, regarding this there should be another digression regarding in fact mostly the the fact of you know wuis that was employing them in which kind of formation and to make the long story short uh, as we've seen many times the knights that were essentially coming to dominate the battlefields from from these centuries um, onwards um, as is the tent that uh, really creates the militia as, as such and defines better in, in albeit gradually of course but also a, a particular fighting style and um, and not just on horseback by the way because the the, the shield uh, of course is longer uh, down the essentially the leg that was very exposed on on, on the side uh, when when on horseback etc but uh, as you know it was used also from by the infantry the, the the real difference regarding the flatness or convexness stands in the fact that actually the better trained troops had convex shields right and that shield walls that require in fact the a, a type of shield to overlap with one another in a continuous line actually are more for kind of militia type of troops or at least troops that are more um as always more functional information but that in this sense do not uh, show much of a greater almost super mystic individualism uh, as much as in fact even filing of rank soldiers may have i mean the the, the roman legionnaire had con cave uh, convex shields because uh, it was still functional to that kind of warrioristic individuality that actually existed even in the peak of the ultra brutal uh, collective training of the Roman legions. The same can be said about, say, an average, uh, in fact, 11th century uh, knight that needed to act more individualistically and therefore being out there sometimes alone uh, had to somehow enter better uh, with his chest within his shield, like figuratively the, the purpose of the convexness per se. Um, this is now not very important, just like a notion. Uh, Shields naturally were of wood, um, but could apparently be pierced by a strong uh, length thrust. So th the shield is just an extra defense. And as you know, uh, during th in the following centuries, the shields would become ever smaller. So that at, by the time full plate armor came came around, they they also became redundant. Uh, but they could be helpful properly in fencing, which is something that we have um, somehow ignored. Um, Anna Comnena describes the face of the, in fact, the Franks, the, the, the Crusader, uh, Knights, Normans, etc., as, quote, smooth and shining. So we already see that there was something aesthetical, right, about the, properly, the, 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 the visual aspect of not just the shield but the knight altogether we have explained countless times because all this panoply was meant to be a sort of part of the warrior himself right so um, there were, uh, the were the, the way of thinking it um, in this regard is very important it was a, an important degree of uniformity even with the armor coloring armor normally was colored right or at least we have um, evidence of an extensive use of armor uh, being of I don't know colors like green, uh, red, uh, etc. Aside from the blackening that served to prevent oxidation, but hence the you know the the legions of black knights and so on because that was also a practical thing. But it had even there a, a specific meaning and colors here were, were crucial. But the idea of being shiny, first of also reflecting essentially divine light, was one of the most important aspects of this. Um, Anna Comnena says that uh, th this this shield of the Franks could repel any any arrow fired against it, right? Which is a bit um, you know it, it depends really. Also because the crossbow was already around and actually had never disappeared during early medieval centuries as well, 
and uh, normally the best defender was was armor right so if as we know actually uh, even in those instances crossbows could pierce uh mail and so on the shield definitely didn't have much greater chances for that full perfect blow albeit of course it would parry most of them where it would absorb most of them and that's at the end of the day what uh, armor uh, really does to an extent which is obviously calibrated ergonomically to provide with that good enough that allows you for defense but also for primarily being offensive because otherwise it means that you would just lose continuously uh, in the fight so there is a compromise by the late 11th century is however possible that uh, at least some shields may have faced uh, been faced with a thin sheet of metal that of course added to the um, you know to, to the visual effect as well as uh, gilded armors we've seen you know even pieces of gold armor at some point etc were were used um, and uh, for reasons that uh, as you understand are primarily psychological it was mostly a matter of status Yes, but what, is, what did the status mean? It meant, in theory, that you were, of course, a more important person, and thus you were richer, and thus you could afford a much better training, and so much greater things were expected from you, and that's the burden that politically and socially, at this point, with the creation of the knight, as at least we know it in the narrow sense of, of, of high medieval Europe, um, was, went along with. Um, the... Mm, now I think it's useless to talk about the kind of weapons uh, that could uh, be employed against shields, how and so on. This is not uh, for today's video. But focusing, it was important to talk about this, this um, detail, this this evidence to stress uh, the importance of the visual aspect next to the physical one, and in part they overlapped. The psychological one, aside from the symbolism of the of the devices uh, painted on the shields, as we'll see now, was kind of more generally connected with, again, yes, the, the generic symbol that was obviously chosen to boost um, the knight's morale, but also to affect the enemy one. And as we will see, these symbols are very often and Bivalent because they had to contain both like uh, the the wearer's pride in, in a way and and, and so uh, reflecting uh, capacity and terror thus for for the enemy it's a bit like you see those um, opalitic shields uh, depicting the gorgon right the idea is that you are basically um, uh, of course, first of all, directing this, in that case, tonic symbol against an enemy that you deem to be morally weak, to be paralyzed by, according to the, to the myth of it all. But it also means that you are capable of wielding that symbol. And it can be very risky, uh, as we've seen in that video about the... Um, you know, the, the way where the, the fire of that blazes, right? The importance of the Dionysian in the initiatic uh, rites of the uh, warrior brotherhoods. And so the fact that if you hadn't been mastering uh, the most, uh, the, the lowest, most physical, material privations, you couldn't quite uh, prove to have a spiritually elevated soul. And thus you couldn't be able to to handle the brutality of the battle just for the physical point of view you could imagine you know from from a from a moral one right they were ov obviously all one all together so we won't be talking about um uh, the this this in initiatic rites and training because they were the same thing uh also because they never ended right there was all a sort of ladder that you had to climb to in theory uh, divine transfiguration but of course here we're talking even of times in which there was um, a different attitude um, towards the concept at least it was always seen as uh, exceedingly difficult 
to reach and that was exactly what everyone was hoping to achieve with, with the ultimate sacrifice at the end of the day because it just doesn't take to be randomly killed on a battlefield to go to heaven you have to literally again win over the the, the angel of death and transfigure in, it in victory herself right and, and only at that point you will be worthy of heaven um, so aside from this um, and this is valid again. Uh, we, I, I'm becoming sick of the difference between, say, paganism and Christianity because they it didn't exist, right? There weren't even two different uh, religions. It was they were literally the same universal one existing since ever. So, um, trying to say, but ah, Christianity kicked in and kind of diluted the stuff. Like it's n no, right? You know, th this dilution happened if it happened because it does millinerly so and the world ages and yes as, as we were saying before the middle ages were already a step behind but not because you know this decline had not occurred had occurred just because i don't know they, they used christianity man you know if they had used another random religion because that's also how you think uh, you are you have, you're usually told christianity came about um it would have been different no right there is a, a much mm, larger implication and these uh, ways of thinking are dramatically anti-traditional, properly in cognitive bias, and I'm not even going to address them in this video again. Um, but starting from the bio tapestry, that definitely provides with the best um, uh, evidence, right? We we can definitely see more on kite shields than let's say on round shields in general. This in, in military history. Um, the design the patterns are to be found pretty much everywhere different scale It's just that by the time these shields came to be longer for example, they could um, uh, They could definitely allow the representation of uh, specific devices That maybe were also adapted or chosen because they couldn't be so um, symmetric but this is also debatable because you will see actually that um, the way these shields were quartered uh, etc could reflect that kind of um, the, the same kind of symmetry and perfection you find sometimes very s simple symbols that could coincide also with the the, the boss um, uh, as the center of the universe for example here you can see with some lines departing from the center to the external so again there are many ways you can represent certain stuff the question is you know what were essentially the typical zoomorphic designs on kite shields you can again see so splendidly in the bio tapestry first of all there is one one aspect the, the tapestry shows this zoomorphic designs exclusively for the normans this doesn't mean then, say, the Anglo-Danish wouldn't use the same symbols. Uh, could they choose, right? And had they had, you know, shields that could more easily provide for literally the room for painting them. Um, and there are, in the sense, properly practical limitations offered by the shape of the shield. Um, the fact also that the bio tapestry was made by people that, of course, had more interest in representing some, let's say, aspects of Norman culture, say, perhaps more prominently than the Anglo-Saxon one. This is not so even in, in the tapestry because, after all, um, both sides are relatively well represented. The focus is mostly on the Normans, but we're talking about as we know, essentially very similar cultures with the ones that inhabited Britain at this point. And so, again, when we look at the broader mythology behind what we see, mostly dragons, right? Um, and or figures that are hybrid between, again, wolves, uh, eagles, lions, and so on, snakes. Um, the art is also imprecise, so, um, and we don't have to think that it really is right at least again we are modernistically and secularistically obsessed with saying you know wh what kind of animal species is that you know are this what pieces of animal species have been put together here to create this this fantasy 
um, and uh, it's not important because uh, there in in traditional culture everything is blended and especially the type of symbolism as we'll see now that were was meant to to in, in here um, was the one of the Spain the, the the heterogeneity of the forms in which a certain force could manifest in reality, right? And when we um, we look at this and say, well, they are purely mythical beasts, right? So there is nothing heraldic about this. I think there is a mistake as well. So first of all, it is true if we stick to, you know, definitions that heraldry um, did not exist in this time because heraldry is just a a discipline that begins in the modern age um, and so we have we are rather looking at um, uh, a relatively uncategorized by modern standards um, figures that um, do not let's say also fit that sort of apparently though just apparently that dynastic um, association with which that um, we, 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 we can identify uh, heraldry in, in fact in the later centuries for reasons that are obvious right at this point it, in, in history in, in Europe you didn't have that fixed kind of um, amount of hyper powerful households that monopolized Europe as royalty or almost and that thus were extremely also attempted in codifying all the uh, you know the the, the, the various uh, codes of arms according to the proper uh, subdivision of the various branches of, of this dynasties as they were marrying to each other and so on um, here we're looking at symbolism that is supposed also to, to represent what the average um, the average, uh, not even knight, we can still talk about warriors in a, in a broader sense, of course, with a, being careful about the fact that, especially Norman society was uh, one of the most stratified at the time, because it was essentially a, becoming a feudal one. So, of course, that kind of egalitarian ethos was much more present among the Anglo-Danish, that as a consequence also had... Uh, less powerful elites were also militarily uh, inferior, debatably, um, as a consequence. Um, and I think so because, of course, I, I, I do believe that the Normans brought kind of a more advanced civilization from the continent. But we're talking, as we were saying before, also very similar peoples in many ways. Um, and that's also a reason why I don't think, as I was saying before, that an Anglo-Saxon would have not recognized the same exact symbols a, a Norman w was using in that regard. Without mentioning that, of course, these kite shields are actually used um, by the same Anglo-Danish uh, at the time. And in the Bayeux Tapestry, King Harold uh, himself holds one, right? And we know that Harold Godwinson fought basically everywhere against every type of enemy. Like in Normandy, he fought like a Norman on horseback with the kind of heavy cavalry uh, style and so on. Uh, in in England, he would fight with the typical kind of Anglo-Danish uh, infantry formation mostly. Uh, against the Welsh, he would use this kind of set more hit-and-run tactics and almost guerrilla-adapted uh, warfare. So, again, there are no boundaries, there are no uh, categorizations that are useful here to, if not approximately, and very, you know, for, for the sake of the tactics um, that we have to, to make, right? So, simply analyzing the patterns, um, here I just, um, I will not present every single one because uh, there are, uh, first of all, I didn't, put them in order and nor I, I, I did find all the um, evidence that I also um, am discussing uh, iconographically so I'm just relying on other studies that uh, talk about this. So the most uh, at least striking symbols and more uh, um, elaborated ones are definitely this sort of what, what appears at least from the head um, 
canine um, or kind of dragon like so we're talking about other wolves or mm, some sort of reptiles right um, with wings right and kind of uh, a snake tail right that is kind of wrapped uh, around we see uh, on the majority of these um, shields also in the background some uh, some points some stars right there is pro probably a kind of um, very direct reference to the to the sky to universal per uh, perfection for example the same Harold Godwinson uh, shield has this um, uh, essentially a triangle uh, almost Pythagoric one drawn um, with um, with this globe right that as we've seen also in similar videos discussing the ancient symbolism for example the Macedonian sons and so on uh, were pretty much pretty much common so this seems sort of stylization there are there are different also kind of asymmetric types some are very symmetric right uh, with for example these globes around the umbo some are in between some asymmetric bands that again start from the umbo so the center of the shield towards the external and that are uh, interspersed between the bands um, so um, representing here some sort of kind of almost emanatistic uh, concept of the universe where again you know from divine perception eventually the world corrupts and just the world the the reality as we know it is is a consequence of it uh, there are also these uh, bands without globes, but again, the and and the co the colors are as the ones we can see first of all in the uh, in in the tapestry, um, and they are very varied in this regard. There is nothing surprising uh, about it, so we can spot uh, kind of uniformity. Some colors are more present, like red, blue, yellow. This kind of primary colors uh, if you want um, this may have been connected just also with the um, materials used in that case to, to color um, the tapestry specifically uh, but um, the mm, the thing could be surely more buried in um, in practice uh, seeing considering these shields now the zo this zoomorphic figures definitely represent the aforementioned kind of um, hybrid between divine perfection and if you want uh, the, the lack thereof right so the entire physicality of, of bodies properly uh, in, in universal tradition is the consequence of the fall right so what we are seeing here is anima animated spirits that therefore have some some degree of divine spark and that therefore can elevate themselves the, the zoomorphic figures are also mostly pointing toward uh, towards the, with their heads at least looking at a bow right this this is not a coincidence the the snake like is opening um, its mouth look also the others uh, slightly but just in this kind of um, you know aggressive mode and looking just uh, straight ahead but the others are just looking a bow and so also the the form of the of the shield favors this kind of vertical projection as you understand and it's obvious that the bodies here are represented fitting exactly that kind of of um, uh, of shape right but it's a bit the same you can uh, think of the anatomic uh, design of the shield itself I mean um, the 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 larger top is of course meant to include let's say your your chest behind it and then of course the the legs as we were saying before are co cover the leg from the side of the shield uh, as they weren't uh, worn uh, for each side follows the leg uh, itself so in a way the figure painted on the shield reflects part of this um, so the animals chosen here are very uh, ambivalent, right? The wolf, as you know, is actually a ketonic symbol, right? It's much more present actually in Norse um, uh, mythology than it is just like 
in many others, of course, but it's um, at least in a very ancestral way, you see that as the symbol of, of the same Rome because of the legion of Romulus, etc. But um, animal sim uh, that, that kind of wolf symbolism is not so uh, paraded like in more Apollonian civilizations, like say the Hellenic one or the same Roman one. Uh, the Norse mythology, for, for for many reasons, is somehow darker and more dominated by this sense of looming threat, uh, in which the wolf um, is um, always uh, just about fan here, um, uh, more present and is the one that at the end of times, together with the snake, and so that this is the the actual point. He's going to storm the Asgard, and so always. It's always a force that you have to dominate. You know that Fenrir is, is actually Odin's wolf. So um, the divine wisdom that manages to tame the wildest of, of the beasts here is exactly what the knight is meant um, to embody. Uh, but this, in this sense, the wolf is also the young warrior that being uh, less wise due to age is going to perform mostly that kind of uh, animal-like, wild, instinctive role on the battlefield to eventually age up men up, right? You know that berserkers from from the battlefields had uh, not really even disappeared technically, uh, and there is much of that in also in the, in the medieval knight, uh, as there was in uh, again in 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 a bit all the Indo-European warriors. Right, in all the symbolism again, we mentioned Rome, but the same signifier there is, you know, with the with the skin of whichever animal could be a wolf, a bear, a leopard, a lion, etc., represents that kind of initiatic role. The fact that these were just NCOs after all, but they had deserved kind of the top beast like function over the, the other beastlets, let's say that that were not enough to bear the insignia and so there was something divine that derived from that lesser status that was not one of the patrician officers that were kind of properly the, the, the descendant, the most direct descendants of the divine race uh, but um, was you know uh, reliable enough to bear the properly the sacred insignia including by the way the one of the eagle so this the absolute symbol of God. Um, so it's always, as you see, both things uh, at the same time. And in fact, speaking of eagles, you realize that especially the wolf type um, beasts here are winged, right? And you find, aside from the shields, as you know, famously on the tapestry, on the there is kind of the the comic stripe like band, and, and then. Above and under, there are so many other, like in Gothic uh, art, right? You know, out of the cathedrals, you find the little monsters. Well, you find here the same things. You, you see griffins, interestingly enough. You see boars, even what they seem like to be. And the symbol there is exactly this hybrid, at least not for the boar, for, for the griffin, between the eagle and the lion. What's the meaning of this? We'll talk about the the wolf and the snake thing in, in a while. Of course, the eagle is the absolute divine symbol of all the Indo-European peoples. It was the only animal that was believed to look straight um, with its eyes in, in the sun. And so it was the symbol of the winged glory of the Holy Ghost. Um, as we've seen, it's a prominent symbol all over the Indo-European military art from the Romans to the also the Greeks, the Germans. It, it, it's, it's found everywhere. And it appears, in fact, also in the more in the darker north. Uh, even though the crow there is rather not an Apollonian but a Catonic symbol, uh, is present, but it's it's ambivalent even there because, of course, it's meant to devour the souls of the of the fallen uh, heroes, right? There are beautiful um, I don't know Anglo-Saxon or Norse passages um, d describing you know what was like also quite grimly. A battlefield after the slaughter, and that would bring this this soul in in the Valhalla. Now, um, together w again, there would be the, there is the field, said that there is the Valkyrie. We will talk about it perhaps later. 
they all have a role in here, but sticking to the symbolism, the griffin is the symbol of the human transfiguration, per se. From one side, it's, um, it, it's also ambivalent, because from one side, it's an aberration. It's like the chimera, right? Um, but the griffin specifically has the eagle and the lion. There are two positive values. The eagle is divine. The lion represents human virtue. Right, still in, in in the 14th century, Dante describes in the Purgatory the figure of Jesus as a griffin, and the reason being, of course, the in that sense the 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 half ground, right, being man and God at the same time, the Purgatory as in between heaven and hell. So uh, the lion, of course, embodies this enormous virtues. Um, royal ones, warrior ones, right? So the idea is that, especially um, having a, um, a, a an eagle head, right, and a, and a lion uh, body, say, plus wings, let's say, so the hybrid, but still having the eagle first, it's that symbol of transfiguration that looks towards the above, like the, the symbols here in the, in the bio tapestry uh, shields, right? So it's a projection towards the above, right? It's it's towards the super personal, so the divine, and not the sub personal, so the beast, and the aberration of nature. And um, it's been very meaningful that, you, that there are griffins everywhere there. The boar that also appears here has nothing to do with the shield designs, but you find little uh, men fighting against this boar. And it's the symbol of sacerdotal power in a way. Um, it's also ambivalent because, in part, would uh, it's the struggle between the bear and and the, and and the boar uh, in the forest. Uh, that means, of course, the the darkness of the world. But the boar, the, the bear is the berserker, and it's more associated with men in traditional mythology. It also can be furious, but it's also kind of more human-like almost. The boar instead is more like the prey. Also, the the bear hunt is present, as far as man is concerned. But in the order of things, the the bear, of course, uh, attacks the the, um, the 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 boar um, in a way because it represents that sapiential knowledge uh, of the sacrificial victim that is going to be sucked into like uh, the 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 devourer as increasing knowledge and um, in this sense the boar represents more actonic animal connected in fact to the kind of for example the, the goddesses of 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 the hunt um, that have a minimal in fact kind of elevation compared to the the goddesses on the of the underworld but the forest is a bit like the same so the artemis diana and the corresponding celtic um, goddesses as females are a tonic symbol and they they're associated with um, the same animals together with for example the deer um, that is a symbol of wisdom right and in christendom as you know it's also the symbol of christ um, and there are several of course so it's always of course the the annus day in that sense the 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 the, the greatest sacrifice official victim of all, the one that transfigures humanity altogether. So the idea that you have that this bloody sacrifice has however to con to consume itself is necessary for the the uh, for the elevation of of the soul uh, from both sides because when you fight in this initiated rites and battles and so on you basically are killed as an individual and reborn, regenerated like another one. And that's why here we see, together with the canine symbolism plus the eagle one, the uh, serpents, the snake one, which is associated, of course, with the figure of the dragon. And the dragon, as you know from the Sauromatai, for example, from even from Imperial China, is the probably most polyvalent symbol always in of course the light darkness dichotomy the, 
divine and earthly and so on because it's associated with all the four elements of nature uh, uh, fire earth water wind right uh, the, this mm, symbol specifically represents chaos right um, in all the possible forms that it can take in reality chaos in this sense is danger right it and war as von Clausewitz says is the realm of danger right so the idea that you have essentially to to elevate yourself divinely through making sense of chaos so carrying out the slaying of the dragon which is the one of the enemy in a sea of blood but also the one of your own wicked soul into a transfigured divine one is the entire point why the symbol would be used by the top military um, elite in fact of the 11th century battlefields right it was a, a an incredibly powerful ideological mean of individual um, you know empowerment and that could boost this at, from one side in fact dark elements but also the necessary force that is required to tame them right and that's why you have in the in the Indo-European mythology the concept that you have fundamentally to tame and I made a, made a video about this the female goddess of war which is basically the angel of death is the or it's the, the, the valkyrie itself it's the fields uh, more specifically the the furies the arenes in classical uh, religions uh, that in in battle are unleashed they manifest themselves in the darkness of death they're going to storm you even properly the the javelins the the arrows are meant to symbolize that even as as the symbol uh, as the weapons of the inferior uh, tonic forces that do not fight loyally hand in hand-to-hand -hand fighting by throw darts at you th those are still to be handled right and you cannot win say the great champion if you can't even know how to parry yourself from blows which is quite interesting um random blows thrown by by weak uh, uh, beings which is very interesting symbolism for a shield and as you know also in the uh, Germanic uh, epos etc there is always this looming threat representing in fact by the, the the forces of the darkness that fight in a more unloyal way right the 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 the, the Germanic epos always talks about this hero which is is a hero but not fully so because there is always some kind of way in which he could be killed uh, by betrayal because he has maybe used magic but has not thought well how to handle it to the fullest so of course Siegfried uh, here is, is, is a great symbol because it includes that uh, in, in the way he dies but also um, it's, it's basically Achilles right in, in the moment in which he slaughter um, the dragon and he bats in its own blood except for again the um, on, on the back where it's going to be transpassed um, in the end so it's always this idea that nobody is invincible and so that you have to be able to to master everything by perfection in order to become God yourself and this is what they um, they truly believed now yes in mostly a Christianized context which surely had a lot of paganism in it still but as we we're saying mostly overlapping except for the concept of you know can you become God yourself or can you have a medium to do that in that case Christianity introduced Christ but uh, that's also a metaphor let's say as a role for what eventually the same uh, the same relation between God uh, man and, and the Holy Ghost really is about which is the same in, in paganism so more kind of fixing in a more modern secular way the the means available and so in a sense even increasing the sense of distance and and from from God and of course the the stressing the sinful imperfect uh, nature of man but still to boost again what was the ultra elite around which the entire world revolved so that the church also boosted dramatically and, and you know indoctrinated to this kind of ideology of holy war and, and beyond and um, 
and what again the entire society worked for properly all the uh, the, the fodder for the horses and for this you know all the calories spent for these men to train for literally their entire life on horseback and you know the 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 price of, of the panoplies and so on so a huge cost that the, that the, their culture wanted to see embodied in these individuals also from a moral point of view and so the symbolism we see here in the Bayeux tapestry at least is connected definitely more with the the brotherhood circle like the evolution of the comitatus in the masnata if you want or whatever you want to call it so in the retinue of these great lords and with their milites, etc., um, that naturally st uh, stress the need of this transition, of this um, improvement, of this constant uh, ambition to rise uh, ever more. Like just like as you were knighted, right? You had to rise eventually a knight. Uh, this is a very powerful meaning. Right and the wings and the association again of the most Apollonian and the most Ctonic from the wings and, and the snake is the entire symbol of universalism and that's the reason why you know um, Lucifer is crashed by uh, by by God uh, all the uh, you know the, the are think about Saint Michael or Saint George that crushed the snake which is in fact the devil and so all the symbolism that had lived through these cultures, these men, uh, universally throughout all, all these, um, this millennia at the end of the day. Um, this is most of the symbolism you can grasp from the, the Bayeux tapestry. Then here I inserted also symbolism from an 11th century um, manuscript that I also used often in, in other videos of what is essentially an infantry unit uh, with all these guys with, with, with dark hair um, and that they, they're all displaying essentially this almost uniformity right almost like the modern French flag like blue white and, and, and red uh, this this is an interesting picture because first of all it, it it gives you an idea of what it means uniformity for those time standards right it, it's something that just varies over time right there is a, a level of standardization, which is not our own, uh, not one of later centuries, not one of uh, previous ones either, by degree, uh, where these colors are, again, standard, and also the shield patterns are somehow um, similar, right? There are um, essentially flowers, circles, leaves, and given that what these guys look like is just, you know, like a, an average local band militia, you can notice in this sense a, a predominance of the ctonic motive, the, the, the plants, right, the, the vegetables, let's put it in this way, but also a symbol of life, and so a symbol of, again, a lower status that, however, wants to emerge, wants to be r ransomed and redeemed through this military uh, action this military array also the, the spears are, are are quite interesting the the uh, stopping elet wings are, are fascinating the, the shapes of, of the uh, of the tips are uh, different and so on also the costume is interesting because it varies there if you look at them they're hardly uh, alike right there is always some small detail that differentiates them from from one another so the, the importance of uniformity, um, aside from the uh, the, con the the meaning of the pattern content, is is also crucial because we explain many times that in 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 um, in a world where again the you know coercive power of the politics was pretty low and economy was barely above the survival rate, etc., having the w wealth to uh, for, first of all, arm yourself better, and with this degree of of uniformity, let's say, but also having enough um, to spend uh, in color uniformity 
was 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 impressive and generally speaking that uniformity makes you feel like in the unit uh tighter if you want right it makes you feel better part of the world there is a greater esprit de corps and those same colors are meant in those times to in fact to represent also different virtues different values different qualities so um they're never random even per se and it would be interesting to make a history of color symbolism for for that matter which did exist right and especially all these symbols here again we we're not sure exactly in what different places they, they could mean more or less specifically or you know how they would have t articulated their thoughts about the actual value of, of wearing uh, them in in battle but they they were quite specific and they had always a universal meaning because all the universe was conceived as, as a huge hierarchy of symbols where everything had its place and everybody knew essentially what its own really really was all right now i would pass to byzantine designs they couldn't find for creative common copyright um use but that um you know are better explained at that point that the showed by a certain degree and that we get from mm, uh, from different sources first of all we have symbols of the dog eagle snake thing um, displayed uh, in the Byzantine world as well right and given the times and places we're fairly certain that uh, the shield may have been the one of a Western mercenary in Byzantine employ, right? Uh, not not entirely. I mean, a same uh, Roman uh, trooper may have worn them. The point is that, as you know, with the Norman conquest of England, lots of Anglo-Danish fled as refugees to Constantinople also because the Normans at that point controlled also southern Italy and from there they were launching uh, invasions of the same em uh, of the same empire and in fact it's it's seemingly not a surprise that in today's Albania there is on a wall pretty much depicted from around this, the same era in fact the 11th early 12th century a Draco exactly like the one that appears as a banner among the Anglo-Saxons on the Bayeux tapestry. You know that the, the Draco is essentially this uh, kind of in fact reptile uh, shape that sometimes, it, for example, in the, in the art, uh, in the Dacian one we have described, it has a wolf head, just like the ones you see here among the Normans as well. So it was pretty universal. Again, we find even wolf heads in Etruscan, um, in Etruscan warfare and this kind of things. And it, um, it, it looks dramatically close, and those were the same places where the Byzantine army with lots of Anglo-Saxons fought the Sicolo norman army at Durachium. So it's obviously connected in part with the same symbolism that may have revived from these peoples of the north to still maintain them, right? In, in Germany, the Draco is um, documented uh, as late as the 13th century, right before, you know, disappearing definitely. But um, you know that the Varangians were present in large numbers um, since, you know, centuries, right? You can't even say when that actually began because the, the Byzantines hired uh, mercenaries from from the far north since since ever. Right, just as the Romans did, uh, since uh, at least they came in contact with the Germans and so on. So, it's not just the the Nordic connection, of course. It's actually and mostly the Eurasian one. Right, there is a, a brutal uh, injection of this sim reinjection, say better, of this symbolism in Europe during the migration era, but mostly from Sarmatian peoples, right, and uh, also the uh, the the Slavs, the the Varangians, etc., that settled in today's Ukraine, uh, Russia, and so, and so on, uh, were uh, were heavily 
you know, mix with, with the, the descendants, at least of those peoples as well, fierce equestrian cultures that also had the, the cult of the armored, uh, essentially of the knight, right? Because the, in, in their mythologies, as you can see in the obsession, one in others, th there is this great uh, hero and deity of war that is essentially a, uh, a uh, knight it has scale armor just like one of these dragons could be, but in metal, because that's the what they literally thought really were. The dragon, naturally, as we were saying before, was ambivalent. Slaying the dragon meant to win the treasure that he he um he had within himself fundamentally that he guarded. Um the um, the, the same word for bridge, for example, in Latin is the same one of in Sanskrit that for for uh, and in actually, in um, in ancient Greek, Pontus, by the way, for s stormy sea. So it's the the idea that you have to get through chaos to slaughter the the worst part of yourself. That, however, allows gives you back a knowledge that can never c cannot be obtained otherwise, and that is the greater one that allows you to re to regenerate in, into a new. Um, to a new warrior again, it's just Siegfried slaying the dragon. It's as if he had slain himself, and he regenerated in the blood, in the life of um, of of the of the same. Uh, it's just that that's why the Franks, for for example, of course, even more so for dynastic reasons, where the Merovingians were they were obsessed with blood, um, and they were obsessed with the passion of Christ, and and so everything that recalled that sacrifice that was the ultimate universal one that every warrior uh, sought to, to achieve as the the greatest um, reward for for obtaining the greatest reward of all, which was in theory salvation but it was a forever on ongoing struggle right so without god you couldn't make it either this uh, this is the entire point of the Indo european religion in many ways that I discussed as i was saying before um so uh, it is true let's say that central eastern northern european populations had remained somehow closer to the spring of these ideas simply because they were being largely tribal peoples they had maintained that degree of militarization that gradually would also end for them. Um, and that was somehow mm, expressed in different ways during cr Christendom uh, with the Crusades, with the Holy War and the broader moral and scientific reflection that that still arrived to this day, right? And that, uh, however, we have, let's say, forgotten in its roots and how it began, right? and, and the fact that it was all about this, and that fundamentally our ancestors had gotten everything sorted out, also because these entire principles, as you know, have been resumed by psychoanalysis, by anthropology, by history of religion. I mean, they were right on, on so many levels about how the human psyche really works, right? And that's what makes these universal values that were shared at the time also among this huge amount of people. I mean, even in the Americas, they believed the same things, even though they were relatively isolated, the rest of the world. If you look at, I don't know, the the symbols of flying dragons and, you know, demons in, in Giotto's 14th century art, uh, they're dramatically similar to the to the, to the the ones of the dragon in, in, in Imperial Chinese art, right? There is uh, definitely a shared awareness um, that especially through the uh, Eurasian steppes was always kind of spread through these the symbols and one that struck me actually because we get it only from the Byzantine sources is the following because um, we at least in the West we are more familiar with this concept in a sort of kind of more um, uh, say there are reasons why we we, we, we mostly stick to the sense maybe we know the Bayeux tapestry better than we know the uh, Schlitz's manuscript, right? But it, it's something else because this influence mostly came from the the steps. And when we look at um, the, the Byzantine uh, manuscripts, illuminations, the aforementioned uh, Schlitz's one, we see striking symbols such as wings wings and clothes 
right? This one should remind you something. Because um, wings, of course, are part of the same divine symbolism of the step, right? Angelic figures, again, especially from the 6th century onwards, from the Gepids, the, the Byzantines, the Longbirds, uh, are, again, the revival of St. Michael's cult um, that was very alive, I, I, as you know, in even among the Normans, with Mont Saint-Michel, just to make an example, that was twinned with the Longobard sanctuary of St. Michael in, in fact, Mount St. Angel in Apulia, where the Normans eventually also take over again um, and keep talking from, let's say, from the channel to, to southern Italy. And again, with that connection that we've seen just across the Adriatic, you have the, the Byzantine Empire, the Anglo-Saxon refugees, and so on. But the wing is a prominent heraldic symbolism in much later times, in Eastern Europe and the Balkans. It's actually part of later Ottoman heraldry, and you find this laid out beautifully in a Byzantine source of the 11th. The winged hussars, even though people say, you know, they really didn't have wings, it was full of horsemen wearing wings in the, in the broader east, right? Um, hussars from different cultures, Ottoman cavalry had them. This was, of course, an angelic and at the same time, inferic symbolism, just like the one of St. Michael, right? That is identified by the long birds with Vodan himself because of the wisdom. Right. In fact, he slains the dragon that is that as, as, at the roots um, of the Erminsul, kind of destroying the basis of the world. And it is, in fact, um, common for all these cavalries that um, live in Europe, also quite picturesquely, folkloristically, and imitated eventually by Western cavalries as late as the, the, 18th, the 19th century, as you know, that share this terrific idea, just like uh, probably, I don't know, the Roman legionnaires that at battle Adrianople were being chased uh, by uh, Visigothic and Ostrogothic cavalrymen, would see from wherever places of the empire they had been drawn, uh, maybe they were Germans themselves, etc., would surely see fatally before their death, in that moment when the hero should see the Valkyries, uh, you know, swirling around and, and the furies uh, and, and the literal hell being um, unleashed in front of them would see in those cavalrymen, those angels of death that they should have been fought and that instead were there to slaughter them because if you do not beat the angel of death you will actually get the traditional death that is, you will be massacred without transfi having transfigured and you will basically disappear swallowed by the deities of the underworld because effectively you would have not been enough for transfiguring so these are ferocious symbols of that I mean the clothes themselves represent of course the predatory nature the the aggressive the offensive the confident the 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 bloody nature of victory uh, of the empire right and the destiny of civilization that is to rule over the, the the other peoples um that were not enough right and thus must be subjugated by divine right right because that that's the only possible order that can take place aside we cannot control the universe otherwise um and um it's the same symbol of, of the eagle of rome that lives until the 19th century and and so it's again a symbol that was quite graphically meant to depict that process that would give you the this is what you have to understand here is that the people who wore the symbols were fanatically exalted about it right they had a moral load that you can't even think a human being can 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 have nowadays because nobody fundamentally displays it anymore we're not trained to do it anymore we're terribly weak to levels that would have been disgusting to, again, even an average of these knights in the, in the 11th century, right? Just for those who also think, oh, those were my ancestors. Yes, ancestors would have spit in your face for the disgusting slob that you are because you don't know anything fundamentally about them. 
um, in the first to, to the core root of their values that are these ones, not the ones of winking at you just because, you know, you're a product of them raping someone, right? And they didn't give a damn about that. Actually, were they felt pretty accomplished about it because the, actually the traditional ideology entailed that at the same time. Um, there are also other interesting symbols like there is a sort of uh, another leaf with root that also symbols life and rooting and, and the the same tree of life right it's a bit like the um as it was again for even in the bible the oak is the the center of the world um the the, the capitolium actually the romans had uh, um, uh, an oak themselves so we just think ah, oh, it's, it's the north it's universal indo-european imperial culture right if you if you reject imperial uh, world domination naturally we see other symbols such as crosses that in in the symmetry in the geometry of it have that kind of so symbol of centrality again of the center and then the, the world that departs from it that can also be flowers uh, in the same meaning of life uh, essentially expanding growing you have more simple checkered uh, patterns of sorts that represent dualism in that sense as well um, there are and i'm talking here especially about like the crosses to be found in the bayou tapestry as well but in the byzantine manuscripts whenever you find these cat shaped things in the in the silices specifically you find also slightly different designs. For example, there is one horizontal band that at some point in the you know heraldic devices of the following centuries would be found. Um, albeit this may have also been some f sort of strengthener. In any case, there are simple kind of almost absolute symbols that can fit that um, still that universal idea. So wings, angels. Um, angels of, of life, there are also angels of death, um, dragons, the symbol of the subconscious of the cosmic order that you have to, to dominate and uh, possess um, this, uh, the wolf as well. So uh, are ambivalent symbols of uh, life and death. And I think this is pretty much what we can say. Of course, uh, the colors could vary dramatically, as we said before, so I will not digress on them. And yet, I would say that probably we underestimated the degree by which a single warrior could customize this shield pattern to essentially make it unique in some ways. Because these uh, devices, y yes, are simple compared to the later heraldic ones but we don't have to think that in that regard they were just okay i i, I paint this because i like it because th that's what i presume most people reason like no th this thing was also properly to identify people right the shield had that specific function they weren't uniforms properly and the reason why everything seems so relatively heterogeneous is that we don't understand these people kind of knew each other very often so if you saw that symbol in a way it could be universal but the colors the the shape the etc was that one maybe a single person would change it over time and it is true that if you pick uh, i don't know an oscar um he maybe was given the shield by his his master was provided with with the equipment by his master but eventually he would probably paint the shield uh his own way or maybe if you know, if the master pretended for some minimal uniformity, um, there, there may have been some code for which you could vary some aspects of the device, but still maintaining other unchanged and so on. So I think the fact we cannot trace that because unfortunately if it's un undocumented, but you can easily see that these shields are similar, yet all kind of different from one another. Makes me think that the what we intend by heraldry in embryo was there and it's kind of obvious right because throughout all military history shields have been customized 
and not perfectly uniformed. So a shield is pretty big, so you can properly dr draw different things on it. Um, if you look at also, you know, shields of previous centuries, they're pretty elaborated. I mean, even the the decorations, you know, that especially in the mig during the migration era, the, the especially uh, of course the richest graves, but they had pretty refined, as we've seen, also pre precious metals um, decorations that are obviously symbolical but do not have, aside from maybe the strengthening, um, uh, you know, uh, function of the metal itself, but in the form it was was um, uh, decorated. Of course, th it had a just a, a symbolical purpose. Um, same Roman ones were pretty elaborated in, in the same way. Um, so this seems to have been really normal for including these specific meanings within the same shield that had an enormous value, right? Uh, not as much as the weapons, I talked about swords often as well, but secondarily, quite, because as we've seen, the same dualistic concept entailed attack and defense, prevalently attack, because that's the, the, the Apollonian, the hero one, the defense is just like for the kind of the loser, but you cannot win if you don't master both because also the shield by the way can be an offensive weapon and in any case it's a necessary element of the panoply so I think this aspect is particularly uh, relevant and should be um, investigated more by apologists, by anthropologists because um, I think we have arrived to a point in history where you cannot um, deny that uh, the understanding of warfare is to be carried out primarily from a spiritual point of view and uh, not in a technologistic or materialistic way right and just saying oh look look at this bunch of idiots they didn't even have heralds or when they actually had right and so and the, uh, the only idiot here is you because you you have a chicken brain right that is nothing in comparison with what these men were able to sort out just for the, 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 the pressure they received from the world they lived in. It was a dramatically complex to handle. Well, you basically don't have to do anything but keeping to alienate yourself, pretending that a minimal effort is you know, a major existential problem. Um, so I will naturally keep making videos about shield patterns and uh, investigate th this aspect also for later times because uh, also in the later heraldry naturally this symbolism remains right just it's more varied it's more articulated in a sense it shows paradoxically the distancing from the from the more absolute form and so that kind of loss the kind of forgetfulness in a way of uh, of the sacred in the hearts of men that uh, occurs over time just keeping these things alive however in our own memory because at least that's a way we can we have to kind of dig into them again and, and recover these traditional meanings for today however I stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time Bye.